today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap today as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of today's event, you will have the opportunity to listen to it later. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during our webinar you have a question for our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. And we'll get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Okay, with that we will go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is distributed tracing and practice. Our speaker today is an expert in the field by all means. His name is Evo, and he is the CEO and product manager at Plumber. Hi, Evo. Great to see you. Uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, welcome, yeah. everyone. Uh, so I guess as many of you today in the audience, I used to be a developer once. Somewhere I took the wrong turn and uh, ended up in product management and uh, now uh, in the CEO role in a company that's uh, building application performance monitoring and real user monitoring products. But uh, that's not the topic today, but while building those products, uh, I understood that uh, not just us, but all the vendors in this market rely heavily on what's called distributed tracing. So after uh, being years in this, in this market, I thought to share the insights of how distributed tracing uh, can help you in your daily lives. So let's see uh, what we have in store for you today. Uh, we'll start with the really basics. First, to understand what's even triggers the need for the distributed tracing in the first place, and go over some really basic concepts. So if you're not yet on board with what the distributed tracing is, don't worry, we'll get you up to speed in the first few minutes. Then we move on to the slightly more interesting part, uh, sharing examples in how distributed tracing can help you, and move on from throughout the series of examples, from simple ones to some more complex one, uh, increasing the power level effectively along the way. And at the end, hopefully sharing some insights to you how you could benefit from distributed tracing, let's see some of the options or some different routes you could take when being interested in adding distributed tracing to your production servers. But as promised, let's check how the need for distributed tracing even was even born. In order to have a distributed tracing need, well, you effectively need distributed services. And it effectively builds on uh, two macro trends. Uh, first and foremost, uh, well, you cannot really control innovation from top down. It's really the grassroots level of, uh, innovation that fosters innovation in both small and large companies. And also the very same companies feel the need to innovate faster and faster. So even the largest companies are just forced to pick up uh, chapters from the startup playbook and follow those or be out from the business. So what does this really mean for the IT teams? Well, first and foremost, to support innovation at grassroots level means that uh, 10 to five years ago, enterprises started moving away from good old monoliths to microservices, enabling in innovation in individual teams. And in parallel to this move, uh, DevOps adoption was gathering pace. So effectively uh, bringing onto the stage a set of tools and methods to make sure that the innovation that gets built gets into production fast and without as uh, many errors as humanly possible. So those two macro trends uh, build the foundation for seemingly nice life. Your teams can innovate in isolation or in relative isolation from one another. And the result of this awesome innovation uh, gets deployed in production in no time. So what can possibly go wrong with this? Many of you probably already know. Uh, besides what used to be one stable uh, big box, you now have a whole herd of microservices under your management. Uh, besides just one single service, you now need to understand what's going on in a few dozen of different services built on different technologies and released not monthly or quarterly, but instead daily or even hourly. So that builds the foundation uh, for uh, different issues to arise. Uh, every change is dangerous by nature. 
and more changes means that you're just playing the game of odds every individual change can have just um, one percent of chance of uh, bringing something bad to the table but when you go through 30 of such changes the chances of releasing something that's broken you know, has increased to 25 percent uh, so it's not just when something's got bad is going to happen but when it's going to happen next uh, and also the complexity of understanding what's really causing uh, all those uh, availability and uh, uh, performance issues has increased. All the dependencies be between microservices and uh, call stacks that can be up to a few dozens of different microservices level deep make it really hard to find the needle in the haystack, to really find the root cause of your potential issue. So those, uh, so this has effectively uh, built the foundation for both the distributed the services and the need to somehow trace all those distributed calls now and the problem that without the distributed tracing happens tends to manifest in different ways but one of those can start seemingly innocent like this a customer support ticket contacting your company and claiming that something in your digital services doesn't work as expected Customer support escalates it to IT, it lands on your desk, and uh, you start investigating. And this innocent looking email turns in just a few weeks into multiple email exchanges, uh, trying multiple different tools to figure out what was going on and how to fix the problem that the customer was presumably facing. So that's way, one way of how missing distributed tracing can turn your otherwise productive uh, work week into a chaotic uh, trial and error. So that has set the long, a landscape for uh, saying hello to distributed tracing. So imagine that instead of uh, looking at the complete mess, you would have an end-to-end -end trace for every request arriving at your distributed system boundary and capturing entire trace throughout every microservice that gets called during this request and the links it into the uh, original request. So you, as a result, you would have a visibility to the entire trace. And that's indeed what the distributed tracing is all about. A typical trace in almost all the tools I've, I've seen and used uh, will eventually be visualized similar to this, consisting of what are called spans, one span denoting uh, the time uh, or, the, or the individual uh, outcome of the request to a particular microservice. And those spans get linked together in a timeline to form one single distributed trace. Uh, so how is this possible? The cornerstone of this, uh, of any distributed tracing solution is what is called, is, is based on what is called universally unique identifier. So this is effectively uh, a random number, uh, the generating of which requires no central coordination. If you remember, our system was distributed. And in such distributed system, it's hard to have the central random number generator uh, to be used in such occurrences. So every node in this distributed trace uh, is allowed to generate this universally unique identifier. And it's, for all practical purposes, guaranteed to be unique. Uh, to give you some idea how unique, for example, if you're not really afraid of being hit by a meteorite, then you shouldn't really be worried on your UUIDs colliding. So what goes on with these UUIDs that get generated? So let's assume a request arrives into an eShop. This particular request gets assigned a UUID uh, that's visible on the screen, and the start of this trace is registered as seen it started after 7 p.m. Now this uh, UUID gets passed along to the downstream node, in this case a submit order node. Now the submit order node receiving this doesn't start a new trace because it found uh, the UUID already for coming in from the upstream and just joins this existing trace. How is this possible? How do you pass along such UUIDs? Uh, most typically, it is done by just passing it as a custom HTTP header. 
most of the microservices communicate with one another uh, using the good old HTTP protocol. So as seen in this example, which comes from, from our product, uh, every vendor or every open source uh, solution effectively adds their own custom header, which gets passed along uh, across different microservices, which either start a new uh, trace or join an existing trace if they already find such a header in the upstream. So that uh, builds the foundation, uh, generating the UUIDs and passing those along. And now each node uh, participating in this distributed trace registers the time when the request arrives at the boundary of this node and also registers the end timestamp as seen in the last node in this trace, check inventory node. As seen, uh, checking the inventory took 13 seconds. And it also registered uh, the end result. It responded with HTTP 200 OK, meaning that uh, the check inventory operation uh, responded successfully. So that gives us uh, the basic attributes for every span that gets linked into a distributed trace. They have to join or create a new ID. They register their start and end timestamp, and they uh, effectively capture the outcome that happened within this node. In this case, an OK operation. So the responses get sent uh, back upstream. The upstream node can register their end timestamp and send the response back all the way to the original node that received the request that then sends the response to the client. Beautiful. We have captured our first distributed trace. Wasn't so hard, was it? Uh, before we move on to the actual examples, um, a few more crucial elements. Uh, so who is capturing those spans and uh, who is composing the distributed trace out of those spans? So uh, in order for any node participating in the uh, distributed trace to be able uh, to capture the information, they need to include something that's typically called an agent. That's denoted in the uh, scary looking guys uh, with hats. So every node here uh, is, uh, has attached an agent that captures the data and sends it to a central server. Such agents uh, either can be introduced in the source code level, where the software engineering it, engineer itself introduces the custom library to the dependencies and then um, uses the library code to build hooks into their application code. Or they can be introduced at bytecode level, for example, a JVM or a .NET runtime can introduce such agents uh, at bytecode level, instrumentation, or uh, as last resort, uh, you can use uh, native code and uh, via what's typically an LD preload, uh, overwrite some system level calls and replace those with your, uh, your own calls in order to capture the information that you need. In any case, after getting this information by the agent, uh, they now get sent to the single uh, centralized piece in this equation. Uh, there has to be a centralized piece that uh, accepts all the data that's now nicely captured by the agents, uh, assembles it uh, in order to build the entire trace. Remember, every node sent only a part of the trace. So now those traces get assembled and are made ready for querying and visualization. Let's look into those uh, later down the road. And as an outcome, you'd get to see a distributed trace, which consists of spans. Every span registers its duration and the outcome. Out of those, the entire duration and outcome of a trace will be calculated. And also both the spans and uh, the trace itself can be enriched with additional metadata, such as, for example, the user ID. Uh, so a distributed trace is composed and we know what, is it, what it is composed of. Besides, we learned that there is a need for one single centralized uh, piece in the equation and the agents have a role to play in this field. That has built us uh, the groundwork and uh, we can now uh, see how we can uh, put those distributed traces into good use via different use cases. Uh, just for example, we'll start with uh, something as simple as uh, removing the need uh, uh, to, 
to reproduce or gather evidence when responding to support tickets and then expand and understand how uh, and whether uh, we can actually turn it around and instead of waiting for our end users to report bugs for us, maybe we can use the distributed traces proactively in order to uh, expose the problems and respond to those before the users even call us. Let's see if this is possible, but let's start with simpler, simpler examples first. Going back to this uh, hypothetical support case that we started with, John is writing us about the problem he's presumably having. I guess each and every one has seen um, uh, the situations where those claims have to have actually uh, no evidence uh, anywhere in the logs, in the metrics that are captured. But let's see, maybe the distributed tracing will have us a different answer than what I see being used in situations where no distributed tracing is, play, uh, is in place. So during those two weeks where the email exchange was going on, we see on average six different tools being used. From and the most commonly used tool happens to be the good old grep, grepping through different log files, or in more modern days, you would use some sort of uh, log analyze, uh, analyzing systems, but borderline, bottom line case, it is still the good old grep. Different profilers being attached, heap dumps being done, garbage collection log being analyzed. So effectively, uh, the engineer responsible for the support ticket really needs to uh, use all the playbook he has. But let's see if the distributed tracing was in place, and what would this response and then the use case for the engineering question would have looked like? So what if those distributed traces captured uh, in their metadata include the customer identification? If we did that, then it's trivial to build a UI which is able to query those traces based on the user identification, which can be an email as in this example or a username or anything for that matter. And now, if we would search for uh, what John experienced uh, during the, uh, the time when he was uh, presumably having some issues, we could indeed see that uh, John has tried to submit an order. Submitting this order took him more than 20 seconds, and worse, it failed. And it failed in the charge credit card uh, span, which took a long time and then failed out altogether. So that has removed us the need for, uh, to actually verify whether what John was claiming was true. Um, and allow the uh, thanks to the metadata added, and also locate the source for the problem, at least to the precision of the span. So we know now that the charge credit card span is where we should be looking for the problem. Not crate order, nor check inventory. The charge credit card span was what uh, triggered uh, the non-200 series re response, typically a 500 series. So we have seen uh, the first really simple example of how we could actually verify what the user claimed and zoom into the root cause. Or, at, well, not really the root cause, but quite close to the root cause. But as we see, we can do so much better. So let's see what this better could do. Let's look, go back to the very same uh, situation where the submit order uh, microservice was invoked by John 7 p.m. on uh, June 17th. It failed, but what if uh, the distributed tracing solution at hand would also not just highlight the span that the error originated, but actually capture the error itself and link it to the span? And if we, if the solution can do that. What if the solution can group the unique errors uh, and quantify their impact? And in this case, we might see a situation where indeed we can verify that Sean experienced an error during the order submission, but he was the only one. He was the only guy who experienced the timeout exception during his order submission. So even though uh, John really uh, faced issues, Maybe this doesn't justify uh, the priority one response. Maybe it can be postponed over other most burning issues. So uh, this is an example where if we would enrich uh, the distributed trace slightly, 
uh, then we are uh, empowered to the way where we can really prioritize the individual incidents uh, based on the impact that they really have uh, for the end users. So we would be uh, avoiding the uh, what I have started to call a decibel-driven development. We can make sure that we respond first to the errors with higher impact and save the ones with minuscule impact to the later. But actually, this is only still scratching the surface. Let's see if we can go and expand the example. And we, would, we should expand it to zoom out to see what the user really experienced. So what if the very same trace we monitored starts not at the serv server boundary, not that the uh, when submit order first reached our server farm was the first microservice touched. But what if we start to distribute the trace already in the device that the end user is using? In this case, a browser. So as seen, uh, John really made a user interaction in the browser, probably submitting an order. Uh, this started by first by doing few uh, static resource requests to the server. And then before doing a submit order request, which failed, it uh, did an, uh, it called to a microservice called check credit, which re responded directly to the browser and didn't cascade through the submit order. So, and what if those uh, microservices and the trace traversing through those microservices was also enriched with the errors that actually uh, occurred in those traces? And we could see that, uh, yes, John was the only guy who experienced a particular error in the context of order submission, but this check credit uh, microservice has been broken for not just one user, but 150, at least in context of 150 unique uh, distributed traces. So this might deserve a way higher priority and the submit order itself could be just a collateral damage. So, uh, so this is an example where the true impact of a distributed trace uh, reveals itself if we zoom out to the level uh, what the user is experiencing. So the lesson learned and what's often forgotten is that the distributed trace can and should leave the server rooms whenever possible. Uh, so and, and the end-to-end -end trace is really the way uh, where you can get a unified view of what the user experienced and can also capture, make sure that they capture the impact of the root cause correctly. So we have learned of uh, how we can use the distributed traces uh, to verify the customer claim without needing to reproduce it yourself. Uh, we have learned of how we can prioritize the response by quantifying the impact of every individual error or bottleneck linked to such bands. And uh, we have seen that uh, if we go uh, one level uh, beyond the server room, namely, uh, and attach our agents also to the device um, or into the a browser that the real user is using, uh, we can really capture the true impact. But it still boils down that John had to call us. Do we really need to wait for the John to dial up our customer support number? Maybe we don't. As a matter of fact, if those distributed traces are captured, they reflect the end user experience, both in terms of availability and performance. All such traces captured uh, aggregate, aggregated together, uh, really uh, reflect what the, uh, what John and other users experienced in their devices. Now. So what if we would use this signal to alert you or uh, anyone in charge for the particular production service in situations where either the availability or performance of the system degrades for your end users? And as seen in this particular uh, slide, uh, indeed, uh, on July 30th, uh, a particular release to one of our own production servers uh, really uh, spiked the error rate, uh, what used to be uh, beyond 1% of an error rate for this particular service, spiked to beyond 6%. This was considered uh, abnormal and an alert was sent out, all based on effectively the distributed traces capture. And when this alert was sent to a particular channel, and when responding to the alert, thanks to the distributed traces, 
particular errors uh, were linked to the traces and thanks to those uh, traces being in place, we are able to see that even though there were five different errors impacting the users, just fixing the first one would have given us two thirds the, of the impact and fixing top three errors would have mitigated 99% of the outstanding impact. So it's quite uh, easy to see here that you shouldn't be waiting for your customers to call or using any kind of proxy metrics to really learn about the situations where your users are suffering from availability or performance. Instead, what you can do is uh, to rely upon the distributed tracing metrics to be the best signal uh, to, ref to be sent, for example, either to your pager duty pages or to your Slack chats for your engineers to respond immediately. Uh, so now we have a really expanded case and showing you the ways of how you can really harness the true power of distributed traces. Um, I hope now uh, you have been uh, seeing some use cases which could uh, really simplify some of the problems you face in your daily lives. So if you're now uh, excited to see how those different uh, distributed tracing solutions can be adopted, let's look uh, what's out there. First and foremost, I think I should start with that in 99.9% .9 of the cases, I wouldn't recommend anyone to build their own distributed tracing solution. Having built one, it's actually slightly more complex in nuances than it looks on those slides. Uh, so unless you are at Netflix or Twitter level, you're probably better off of taking what's already built. And first and foremost, uh, open source distributed tracing solutions. There is quite a lot of them on the market. Most of them uh, got uh, the initial spark of idea from the Google Dapper research project published in 2010 and have uh, taken it from there. So there are different varieties, but all of them follow the very same pattern. They capture uh, spans and those spans get uh, some metadata and those get aggregated in the server and then made available for querying and visualization. So that's one example how you could introduce, for example, Zipkin into your uh, PHP application. So if you happen to have a microservices built on PHP, this is how uh, Zipkin would capture, start a distributed trace and build a span. Uh, as you can see, uh, this integration is done at source code level. So it's uh, kind of creates a dependency with the Zipkin framework. Uh, but the captured trace uh, really looks like a distributed trace should look like. That's a beautiful example of what you would get from Zipkin, given that you adopted it. Uh, with the open source solutions, it's, uh, it's of course uh, comes uh, without the cost that att attached to commercial vendors. And uh, this kind of approach is extremely flexible. You can add whatever metadata you want to the span. You can attach it to whatever programming language you need. The APIs are yours, so feel free to knock yourself out. Um, but as a result, as I mentioned, you'll end up having a dependency with your application code and introducing a human factor. So if a newly built microservice author just forgets to add his uh, service endpoint to the Zipkin monitoring, as we saw, uh, you would have a blind spot in your distributed trace. And the usability of those central servers tends to be quite limited. Uh, so you won't get all the analytics you might need or might like eventually. So let's look at the commercial vendors. The commercial vendors for unknown reasons to mankind don't call distributed tracing distributed tracing. All the commercial vendors, Plumber included, uh, usually package this as application performance monitoring or read user monitoring products. But rest assured, all of them use the very same underlying concept distribute the traces to capture the traces to highlight availability and performance issues. Uh, those solutions typically take a less obtrusive path and uh, attach themselves uh, as seen in, in this particular example. This is a way how you would attach, for example, a plumber agent to your JVM. Just a startup parameter to however your JVMs get started. But the distributed trace itself that it does, ends up being captured uh, is doing the same that the, uh, that the Zipkin example or the open source examples do. 
uh, with some enrichment in, in, in detail level, but that's already a nuance. So you'd get the same result. With commercial solutions, there is a cost side, of course, uh, but there is slightly more heavy lifting that's done for you. So the installation doesn't uh, involve any code changes and uh, you have overall less nuances. So if I were to uh, tie it together, then uh, I hope you uh, now, uh, those of you who didn't know what the distributed tracing uh, was, are now equipped with understanding of uh, why this concept was born and uh, how is it uh, useful in the first place. Uh, and even more, I hope that the examples uh, sparked some inspiration to how you can actually simplify your daily lives thanks to distributed tracing now at your fingertips. And also some uh, sneak peek into how the different vendors uh, can help you in this regard. And uh, before it tied together, uh, being proud of our every chef uh, has to be proud of their own craft and so am I. Uh, so Plumber is one of the solutions I can recommend you to try. There is a fully functional 14-day uh, trial of Plumber, which you are all welcome uh, to download and attach to your distributed uh, shred races to see how we can really help you with all of the goodies that we covered today. We'll end up uh, bringing you a single pane of glass across your entire service portfolio, integrate nicely with all the good things you already have in place at your house, and end up uh, exp and all of this is still built using the very same distributed tracing that we discussed during today. Thank you. Okay, now great. I'm open to questions. Lots and lots of time for questions here, guys. So if you have a question for Evo, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll go ahead and get started on the questions that we have. Um, let's see, the first question, uh, how can you assemble all the different spans from all the different microservices running different technologies into a single coherent whole? Do you pass some extra information between your agents? Um, yes, uh, as, as we all, uh, also discussed uh, during, uh, during the presentation, uh, then all the nodes participating in this distributed transaction uh, actually pass along the UUID that was generated in the first node accepting the request or the first node triggering the request, depending on whether we are monitoring or not the device that the end user is, is using. So uh, the HTTP headers pass along this UUID. And this is effectively the only information you need to pass between your nodes. You can add some other if, if, if for some reason you need, but typically this is the only thing that gets passed along by all the distributed tracing vendors. Okay, great then. Next question. Uh, how, uh, and I think this is, um, I think this is the question, it's kind of broken English here. How does Zipkin help on tracing without thread local storage? Um, so now if I, if I do understand uh, the question correctly, then the question is about uh, how does Zipkin make sure that the uh, collected data ends up being sent to the central server without storing it locally uh, uh, for, for different situations. As we saw, Zipkin's uh, approach is, uh, is, I used to call it obtrusive, it's, but it's effectively uh, uh, approach is integrating at the source code level. So it boils down to whether or not the, the code sending it to uh, Zipkin uh, managed to send it or maybe there was an error before it was sent, and or whether there is built-in framework that uh, does store uh, the data in situations where maybe the central server is not available. So it's up to the user to decide really in that case. Commercial solutions tend to buffer this locally, either per thread or in a, in a more centralized location, but with Zipkin it's really down to the implementer. I hope it helped. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, do you have a solution for AWS Lambda-based functions? Uh, great question. Uh, Plumber doesn't offer currently support for uh, AWS Lambda uh, monitoring. It's in the pipeline, but as of now, uh, we don't have the support for uh, AWS Lambdas. Okay. 
All right, great. Uh, next question. Um, what is the memory and CPU footprint of the agent? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a fully legitimate question and I hear this often from the uh, customers as well. Uh, because really, uh, no monitoring solution should really make your application slower in the first place. And that's what uh, that's really based on uh, what the engineers have experienced with, for example, profilers. Attaching a profiler to a production server is almost a certain way to kill it. Uh, but uh, with uh, the APM vendors and the distributed tracing vendors, I think it uh, it, it boils down to uh, first, there is the, of course, there is the real user monitoring side. Those uh, libraries that do the monitoring in the end user device level, they tend to be loaded asynchronously over uh, CDN networks and properly cached. So uh, downloading this particular real user monitoring agent is unnoticeable for the real user. And then monitoring this in the real user device is also unnoticeable. Uh, and this happens within the single user uh, browser, for example. There is not much usage. A human person can only click that much around in his browser. So in there, there is no visible impact. With servers, uh, it boils down to uh, monitoring the different uh, system level metrics. In the D, there is memory, there is CPU, uh, there is network overhead, and in some cases, even disk usage. And I'm proud to say that over the last two and a half years, uh, I'm yet to see a situation where customers taking us to a performance test run see more than a low sing single digit overhead in any system level metric that they're interested in. All right, excellent. Excellent, plenty of time for questions, folks. So uh, if you have a question, go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit it there. Our next question, do you adhere to either open tracing or open census specifications? Um, so I believe uh, the question is uh, whether or not the plumber uh, is currently following uh, those uh, open source specifications. Um, <clears throat> we are currently not, we keep a close eye of what's happening. Uh, I do believe that the future is in making sure that all the different vendors will open their APIs and make sure that they are coherent and matching the specification. Uh, this is really where the future is. But currently it's really hard to, uh, to make sure uh, that those APIs are stable and uh, whether there is a clear winner yet. So I'm keeping a close eye, but not yet. Okay, great. Okay, next question. Um, you may have to help me with this one, Evo. Uh, the microservice like submit order will have UUID or how UUID is collecting here for distributed tracing. Can you please explain this a bit or a bit inside? I'm not entirely sure I, I, I follow this uh, this question. Yeah. I, it seems to be uh, asking the question of uh, how the UUID is generated. If I interpret the question correctly in the, in the first node. So if it's a node in the downstream, uh, then it gets the UUID from the upstream node. The agent just needs to check for whether or not the upstream passed along a UUID and then make sure it doesn't generate one, but just joins the trace with already existing UUID. But if the question was, how should I generate the UUID? There are awesome implementation of this UUID out there. I believe it's already the fourth generation out there. And if you, if you Google for UUID implementation for your specific language, like UUID implementation for Java, you, you'll find awesome examples of uh, how you can, for example, create your own UUIDs. Okay. All right, great. Next question here. Um, New Relic, better or Plumber or Zipkin? Uh, I would assume that um, each of them has their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, my background being from Plumber, uh, of course my answer is that Plumber is the best. <laughs> uh, yeah. New Relic does some things differently than Plumber. We do some things differently than New Relic. And uh, so does uh, the, an open source vendor, such as Zipkin, for example. So uh, I can only encourage uh, you to, uh, to take out the vendors you might be interested in into a trial run and compare uh, ourselves uh, heads up against New Relic or whoever else you might have in mind. Uh, I'm fully comfortable that uh, you'll be surprised of what we have to offer in good terms. 
Excellent. Okay. The next question, uh, is the agent only invoked when a trace request is made? Uh, with so many agents installed, we don't want things to consume resources when not needed. Um, so the agent, in sense, uh, doesn't do any kind of background work. There is no background thread running, uh, uh, waiting for something to happen. Uh, the code that gets loaded is already instrumented during load time. So uh, you're, you, you don't end up finding any additional processes, for example, in your process table or any additional resources consumed in situations uh, where are the, there are no incoming traces. So I hope it answered. Okay. All right, great. Uh, gosh, we, we're getting some really great questions. Uh, next question, uh, do you support gathering 100% uh, of traces or is a sampling al algorithm applied? Uh, this is what we do differently from most of the other vendors and we are proud to say that we don't do sampling. Even with the biggest customer of, customers of us sending us uh, billions of spans on an hourly basis, we, don't, we don't, haven't had to fall back to, to sampling in none of the cases. Okay. It's possible that probably, probably if you approach us with a uh, Netflix scale or Twitter scale data, then probably sampling is the way to go. But uh, all the normal solutions, well, I'd say up to a few billion uh, spans per day, don't need sampling with us. Okay, excellent. Next question, which request tracing system would work best with Docker and microservices running on OpenShift container platform? I don't think any of the vendors nowadays can really get away uh, without fully supporting uh, uh, Docker and uh, other containers in their uh, various forms. So I'd say that it's more like pick a particular vendor because it supports uh, a particular virtualization or uh, or a docker uh, but don't pick the vendor who doesn't because <laughs> what i'm familiar with everybody that wants to have a foot in the game has uh, had to adopt uh, all those uh, beautiful means to to deploy and orchestrate your uh, your production deployments okay all right great Great, great, great. Uh, guys, um, I think we still have about 10 minutes for questions uh, at least. So if you have a question, please go ahead and use your uh, control panel and, and submit it. Next question, do you think that uh, after enabling distributed tracing uh, performance is degraded? Uh, uh, I, I think we, we kind of covered it already, mm -hmm. maybe from a different angle. Distributed tracing doesn't come for free. It is effectively additional uh, CPU cycles that you end up burning, uh, additional uh, uh, memory footprint because you need to create some objects to, or, or allocate some memory to keep track of the different things. And you need some network bandwidth to, uh, to now send the gathered data to the central server. So you'll end up consuming more resources. Now, a good vendor uh, keeps it really at bay. I said uh, with, with our uh, customers, everybody who has taken us into our performance run hasn't faced more than low single digits uh, overhead in any system level metric being tracked. All right. Yeah, I know that we have gone over that once before. So do you support different backends for tracing data uh, such as Splunk? Um, uh, nope. Uh, I believe it's it's uh, where do we store the data? Uh, it's only currently just a single backend. Uh, the backend uh, storage is the time series data, which is effectively, this is where the spans and traces live, is uh, stored in Druid. And uh, we don't have a kind of multi, a multi storage capability uh, for, for Plumber servers. I know that some open source vendors try to become vendor neutral, but looking at if you have to query uh, several hundred billion spans in real time. Uh, it becomes truly hard exercise even with one platform. So good luck with this exercise in going multi-platform. <laughs> I'll try to support one and do it good. Okay. All right, great. So we've gotten a couple questions in regarding um, 
GDPR and uh, the personally identifiable information and um, how that, uh, you know, how this solution might potentially collect. So can you kind of mm -hmm. give us a, just a little bit of information about how the user monitoring works with GDPR and other regulations? Mm -hmm. um, I think I understand the origin of the question, uh, especially thanks to the examples I used. Uh, but now if we would, um, how to tackle this. I th I th uh, indeed, uh, both Plumber and every other distributed tracing solution can uh, personally identify a visitor uh, if this particular uh, metadata is captured and sent to the central server. Uh, so this allows to identify the users and makes uh, responding to the support tickets like we saw easy as we saw. Now, uh, and that being said, by default, uh, we don't map uh, the user to their personally identified identity. We don't map um, Mr. John Smith to their email. Uh, instead, but by default, uh, we make sure that we distinguish one user from another by effectively planting a cookie and tracking the cookie ID. But this, is, this doesn't identify the user. It just separates user A from user B, but we wouldn't identify the name of the user. So in order to enable the user identification, you'd have to effectively flip a switch explicitly. And then indeed, uh, we would capture uh, the user's identity, which is up to you to choose which we will map it to, be it a username or an email or something else. And this now might really take us to the GDPR territory. Uh, and now probably the, uh, the consent uh, that you would already be using uh, asking from your customers does also need to explicitly state that plumber would be or any other distributed tracing vendor would be one of the vendors that this information is shared with okay. but it's really possible to capture let's say 85 percent of the distributed tracing's potential without even entering the gdpr territory okay Great. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, what would be the recommended percentage of tracing spans uh, to, that should be collected by the distributed tracing? Um, it seems like 100% could kill the microservice at some point. Um, no good distributed, well, it depends of course on the service. Uh, I would assume that there are some services that are just outside of any standard solutions. For example, if you would be monitoring a real-time stock exchange, which well, uh, works at the sub-microsecond uh, level latencies, so where the really ultra-level optimizations are, are, are needed, then probably uh, these solutions cannot be used. But everything that needs to work in human time, like where the times measured are in, at best, uh, well, in few dozens of milliseconds, uh, then I don't think capturing the spans is an overhead. And I would recommend not to sample, uh, because what happens with samples uh, is that whenever you have a problem and you're looking for the root cause for the problem, <laughs> it's just some horrible law that says that, yep, those samples are sampled out. All those guys who faced the error that you would really now look the root cause for are just not within the samples you have collected. So by default, I don't really recommend the sampling world unless there is some clear reason for this. All right, great. Um, gosh, so many good questions. Uh, next question, is Plumber available as a hosted version or is there an on-prem version as well? Uh, we offer both uh, the SaaS version, which is the one we by default recommend that you don't have to uh, install the server component yourself, but just send it to our SaaS servers. But indeed, if you want, uh, there is an on-premise version of uh, Plumber where the server component uh, sits in your server room and no data uh, ever makes it uh, to, to our way. So that's what typically the government agencies and, and banking and healthcare customers of us tend to use. All right, excellent. Uh, next question. Uh, with proactive monitoring, can Plumber use APIs to create a ticket in Sherwell or ServiceNow? Um, currently, from this product category, the out-of-the-box integrations include only Jira from Atlassian. 
So not ServiceNow or the alternative to this uh, as of now, out of the box. But our API is free and we do encourage uh, to build those integrations and or we can actually help you out thanks to our partners who would be glad to build those integrations given that uh, we'll start working together. Okay, great. Great, we have about five more minutes for questions and we have probably about five more minutes worth of questions here. So uh, moving moving rapidly along, can Plumber cover Couchbase and Kafka tracing? Um, now with those um, systems, it, it, it brings us probably to the asynchronous territory of uh, not request response, but the publish subscribe. So in those cases, it's not so explicitly clear uh, in, in, in human time, for example, of uh, what's the latency perceived and, and, uh, and when was the particular business process ended. So in these cases, uh, out of the box, uh, neither we nor any other uh, tracing vendor can really uh, match the messages in Kafka queue to a particular business process. So in those cases, our APIs need to be used. All of our agents have an open API, which can be used by the uh, publishers and consumers of, for example, Kafka queues uh, or topics in situations uh, where you have asynchronous messaging in between your business flows. So you can keep an eye on asynchronous processes as well, but this doesn't come out of the box and there will be uh, kind of human involvement needed in order to use the APIs. Okay. You would need to show, well, effectively create the spans. Okay. Uh, here's a related question, I believe, um, that you may have already actually answered, but uh, can we use distributed tracing as a plugin in CICD tools? CICV. Continuous I'm not entirely integration. sure I'm, I'm familiar with the category. It, CICD. Uh, uh, currently, off the top of my head, mm, I, I don't know. Okay, CICD is uh, the continuous integration, continuous ah, delivery. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if it stands for continuous integration uh, and the release pipelines of effectively, uh, if you have a nice continuous integration process in place and you have nice automated tests in place, then yep, Plumber can be uh, part of your release pipeline, uh, making sure that the load tests running before the production uh, release can be made uh, doesn't contain any availability or performance issues. But this is not what we recommend for our users. It's, it's quite easy uh, to monitor this with other tools as well. And considering that you have control and reproducibility in your uh, continuous uh, delivery pipeline, then there is limited value that any of such solutions gives us. Uh, we don't say that don't use us there, but we don't really recommend that this is where the value is. It's really keeping an eye on the production. All right, great. So uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Um, let's see, have you any experience integrate, integrating tracing systems with the mainframe? Aha, uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending how to look, uh, no, uh, haven't really tried that one. But I would, I would assume that uh, uh, any open source vendor uh, probably don't have uh, the support for, for any of the particular code running in the specific mainframe, but they would have the data model and server and processing framework so that if you would care to build uh, the tracing for the spans originating from or, or landing at the mainframe, then you could expand such offerings. But I personally don't have the first-hand experience from there. Okay. Great. I'm going to throw one more question at you and then we'll close it out. Uh, can you address vendor lock-in pro problems? Hmm. I would assume this comes from that if you have multiple different technologies in-house and, uh, uh, and now different teams would, uh, would, without the single distributed tracing solutions, would use very different toolings to keep an eye on their portion of the distributed trace. So the .NET teams upstream would look through one dashboard and maybe the JVM guys downstream would, would use different tooling and there would be no single source of truth. So if, if this was the origin of the question, then I do think that yes, the distributed tracing solution makes sure that all your different technology teams uh, stay 
uh, and use the single pane of glass and then share and use the same information uh, to make decisions and uh, solve problems other than just arguing of who is right and who is wrong. Right. So if this was the nature of the question, then I, then I think that's it. Okay. All right, great. Well, that is all the time that we have for the question. So I do appreciate everybody who did uh, submit a question. We had some really great ones today. So thank you so much. Uh, if we didn't get to your question for whatever reason, I apologize. Um, but please know that the folks at Plumber uh, actually will get a copy of all of the questions. So I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. Uh, I also want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded, so if you missed any or all of it, or if you just want to watch it again, that's fine. Uh, you'll be able to do so. We will be sending out an email uh, a couple hours after today's, uh, the end of today's webinar that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. Um, and the webinar, the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website, so you can always go there or check it out. Um, just go to www.DevOps.com slash webinars, look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. And while you're there, please uh, take a look around, see if there's any other webinars that uh, pique your interest. Uh, Evo, thank you so much for a great presentation today. Uh, lots of great stuff, lots of interaction with the audience. So. Um, uh, I would call this a, a successful webinar. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Great, great, great. Well, uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I want to thank the audience for joining me today, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.